beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and of the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heaven and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord... One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the Apostle Peter is reminding his readers here, or his listeners, to remember the words of the Old Testament prophets. Okay, Then he goes into a very specific prophecy that when the end times come, that there will be mockers scoffing about the end times. In other words, when they hear teachings like this, when they hear teachings about the end times, they will scoff according to their own lust. In other words, these are not godly people. These are immoral people. And they mock saying, nothing has ever changed. Everything is as, as it was since the beginning. And Peter then says, and of course that's been fulfilled. We, we know that that's true. And Peter then says, they willfully reject the authority of the word of God and the warnings concerning their judgment. Listen, they willfully reject it. They have made the decision that they will not listen to the word of God. They have willfully rejected the authority of the word of God as the people of Noah's day did and were flooded, so he says, and this world is being preserved for fire and they're going to be judged one day. That's what Peter is saying. And then he kind of throws a curve at everybody. Now, this is not a curve to them because they understood what I'm about to say. God has a calendar and God has been on that calendar since the beginning of time and he's still on that calendar. This is what we're talking about. This is what Peter was talking about, and they understood this. The Jewish mind, this is what the Jews believed. This is what the early church believed. This is what Orthodox rabbis and Hebrew scholars have taught for thousands of years. What I'm teaching you right now, it's not a new teaching. So what is God's calendar? And that's that's the question. Isaiah 46, 9 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am, it says, uh, I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand and I will do all of my pleasure. Okay, so understand this, what the Jewish rabbis teach is that God revealed the end in Genesis 1. God revealed his calendar that he counts time on In Genesis chapter 1, let me say something very important. God does nothing until he reveals it first. The word occult means secret. Our God is not a secret keeper. God wants us to live in the light. And the reason for Bible prophecy is so that we will be prepared for everything that happens. Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So Moses was the prophet of God, and Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, okay, Genesis 1, so that we would understand what's happening and that we would not be living in darkness or be confused or fearful. Now, before we get into God's 7,000-year plan for human history, let me read you one New Testament scripture that's very important. This is 1 Thessalonians. Every chapter in the book of 1 Thessalonians talks about the return of Christ. And this is very specific now in chapter 5 concerning the return of Christ. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write you, for you yourselves perfectly know that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes on them as labor pangs upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overcome you as a thief. You are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Did you know that every time the Bible says that Jesus comes as a thief in the night, it's talking to unbelievers, not believers? 
Jesus doesn't come as a thief in the night to us. Listen, you, yourself, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Then he says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. God has given us Bible prophecy so that we'll be prepared when he comes. He doesn't come as a thief in the night to us. We don't know the exact day or hour when he's coming, but we know the seasons. We know the signs of the time. And here's the importance. When Jesus comes, we'll have our heads lifted up and be ready for our bridegroom. That's the importance of that. And people say, you don't know when Jesus is coming. You're exactly right. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know the season and we know the signs. Let me talk about God's 7,000 year prophetic calendar. Okay, there are seven days of creation in Genesis 1. Remember, Peter is talking about the end times in 2 Peter 3. And he says, remember this one thing, brethren, that with the Lord, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And Isaiah 46 says, God declares the end from the beginning. At the very beginning, he's talking about the end. Well, let me say this. God counts time in sevens. Okay. God always counts times in sevens, seven days of creation in Genesis chapter one. There were seven sabbatical years and still are in Israel's calendar. Every seventh year, they would let the land rest. And then they had seven sevens of years. And the year after that was the year of Jubilee. And the, in the book of Daniel, 490 prophetic years were declared to the nation of Israel. And the angel said, 70 sevens of years are declared for you, Israel, until the very end comes. And by the way, there's only seven years of that left, the time of Jacob's sorrow, which is the tribulation. So God counts times in sevens. There's no doubt about that. And so many Jewish scholars from the thousands of years have taught that Genesis 1, the seven days of creation, corresponds to 7,000 years of human history. In the very beginning, God was saying there's going to be 7,000 years of human history. There's going to be 6,000 years of human history followed by a thousand year millennial rule of Christ. It's over. In other words, it's not arbitrary. It's not because of anything that we've done. At the very beginning, God started his clock and we just happen to be the generation that's alive at the fulfillment of that. Let me prove this to you in several ways. Let me begin uh, by talking about the seven days of creation and how they prophetically parallel each millennium of human history. Listen to what I'm saying. The first day of creation parallels the first thousand years of human history and the most important spiritual event that happened in the first thousand years. The second day of creation parallels the second 1,000 years of human history and the most important spiritual event that happened in the second thousand years of human history and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. And so every day of creation is going to parallel. It's a prophetic grid, if you will, okay? So let me begin. Let me just read these to you. And I'm going to read you what happened on each day of creation and how it parallels that millennium of human history. On the first day of creation, on the first day of the week, light was separated from darkness. And in the first millennium, Adam's sin separated him from God's light. Light and darkness were separated spiritually. So on the first day of creation, God separates the light from the darkness. What, what was the most significant event that happened in the first thousand years of human history? Adam and Eve sinned. And spiritually, light and dark were separated. On the second day, there was separation of the waters above and below. And in the second millennium, the waters above and below were used in judgment in Noah's flood and then separated again. So in other words, in the second thousand years of human history, there was a spiritual parallel between the second day of creation. God brought the waters together, flooded the earth, and separated them again. Just like he did in the second day of creation. On the third day, plants yielding seed were created to fill the world with life. And in the third millennium, a promise was made to Abraham that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. On the fourth day, the lights were created, the lights in heaven were created. And in the fourth millennium, the prophets were given as lights to Israel and Jesus came as the light of the world. On the fifth day, living creatures were created. And in the fifth millennium, Jesus died that we might become new creatures inheriting eternal life. On the sixth day, the millennium that we're living in now, 
Man was created and was told to fill the earth and subdue it. And in the sixth millennium, man has filled the earth and subdued it. What God commanded Adam and Eve to do in Genesis 1, we did in the last thousand years. On the seventh day, God rested. And in the seventh millennium, the earth will be restored and mankind will rest as Jesus rules for a thousand years. And here's the proof, by the way, of that thousand year rule of Christ. This is Revelation 20, beginning in verse one. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit. And shut him up and set a seal on him that he should not deceive the nations, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. Judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshiped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and shall reign with him a thousand years. And so we know for absolute certain that the last thousand years of human history is the millennial rule of Jesus Christ. We are living pre-rapture. There's going to be the next major event that's going to happen on earth is the rapture of the church. We're going to be raptured. When we're raptured, then or soon thereafter, the world is going to experience a seven-year tribulation. But listen, as the world is experiencing a seven-year tribulation, we're going to experience a seven-year wedding in heaven to Jesus. A Jewish wedding is seven days long. We're going to be married to Jesus. And at the end of that, you can read the account of this in Revelation 20 and 21. Jesus returns and we return with him. And he slays the Antichrist, the false prophet, throws him into the lake of fire. And he binds Satan for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. And then he sets up his millennial kingdom. Listen, we rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. For a thousand years, Jesus is boss on the earth. And he doesn't have to be reelected. Somebody say amen. Amen. Okay, but listen to this. So... But listen, at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed and there are mortals on the earth, not us, because we're immortal. There are mortals on the earth that survived the tribulation and after 1,000 years of living under Christ's rule, they go to Jerusalem and try to kill him. Satan leads Gog and Magog, which is an idiom for the nations of the world in rebellion to God. And they march on Jerusalem to try to kill him. At that point in time, Jesus slays all them, sets up the great white throne judgment, judges all the the dead from the very beginning of time. The heavens and the earth are destroyed by fire. That's what Peter was talking about in 2 Peter 3. The heavens and earth are destroyed by fire. God creates new heavens and a new earth. And the new Jerusalem, which is a 12,000 mile cube, comes down and that's where we live with Jesus forever and ever. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. So this is, this is what the Bible says is going to happen in human history, and it's very specific. So that's one way that you can prove the 7,000-year theory of human history is by looking at the prophetic days and how they parallel what actually happened spiritually in each of the 1,000 years. But let's look at another way that we can prove it, and that is by counting the years. In other words, if, if we're in the end times... And there are 6,000 years of human history followed by a 1,000-year millennial rule of Christ. We should be somewhere around the year 6,000. Okay, well, how many years were there before Jesus? Well, thankfully, in Luke chapter 3, there's a genealogy that goes from Jesus to Adam. We know exactly how many generations were between Jesus and Adam, and Bible scholars say there were 4,000 years in the Old Testament. So let's do some ciphering. (laughs) <laughs> four plus two equals six okay so if we're supposed to be around the year 6,000 according to the Gregorian calendar we're around the year 6,000 give or take a few years okay here's another way that you can prove this and these are these are prophetic symbols in the bible here's what Je- Genesis 7 6 says Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth Genesis 7. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the seventh, second month, on the 17th day of the month, 
On that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Out of the 950 years that God had to put Noah and his family on that ark, he put him on the ark when he was 600 years old. And there'll be 6,000 years of human history followed by a thousand year millennial rule of Christ. And there are people who believe that this is symbolic of the fact that Jesus is returning in the year 6,000 or around the year 6,000. Well, let's look at one more parallel. And this is Jesus at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. Now, I want to, I want to remind you now that the Isaiah 46 says that God declares the end from the beginning. Okay, so this is the first day of Jesus' ministry. When Jesus was 13 years old, he stayed back in Jerusalem. Uh, believing it was time for his ministry to begin, begin. And his mother, Mary, you remember, frantically found him. And he said, I must be about my father's business. And she said, no, young man. And she took him home for 17 years. So Jesus just thought, you know, at 13 years old, he thought, I've got to, I've got to minister. Now he is at a wedding. Interesting, God used his mother to tell him he couldn't go into the ministry. And now God's going to use his mother to tell him his ministry's beginning. So this is the day that Jesus' ministry is beginning and Mary is the one who tells him he's got to create wine. This is John 2. Now there were, there were set there six water pots. Remember the word six, the symbolic, of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim and he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast and they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water, that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cain of God. Listen, there are miracles there are wonders and there are signs. A miracle is something that God does supernaturally that only God can do. A wonder is something that makes you wonder. You go, oh, wow. That makes me wonder. <laughs> a sign points to something. This was not a miracle. This was not a wonder. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And God is declaring the end from the beginning. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifest his glory and his disciples believed him. So he's at a wedding, family wedding, with his mother. And they ran out of wine. And Mary came to Jesus and said, son, they run out of wine. He said, woman, what do I have to do with you? And, and, and then rather than ask him again, she told him. And she turned to the servants and said, do what he tells you. Okay, because I know he can make groceries. He does it for me all the time. And... <laughs> That's the King Jimmy version. So, whatever he says, do it. Okay. So, Jesus said, fill up the water pots with water. And they bring the wine. And they're amazed. They say most people serve the good stuff at the beginning and then the cheap stuff at the end. But you've brought the best to last. Okay. Six water pots. Not three, not eight, not twelve. Six water pots at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, what was he doing? He was at a wedding serving heaven's wine. What does Jesus do at the very end of his ministry when he comes and raptures us to be with him? He's at a wedding serving heaven's wine. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 26. I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is symbolic of when 6,000 years have been fulfilled, we will be at a wedding drinking heaven's wine with Jesus. So when I say that we're living at the end times, I'm not being capricious. I'm not just guessing. When you look at time, we're at a tipping point. The 7,000 year calendar of God has been in existence from the very beginning and that's what the Orthodox Jews have believed for thousands of years. That's what the early church believed. And when Peter comes to the church and he's talking to them about the end, he says, you know for certain now that when the end comes, there are going to be mockers mocking the end times and mocking end times teaching according to their own lust. 
because they have willfully rejected the authority of the word of God and the warnings concerning the judgment that's coming on the world. But beloved, beloved, you remember this one thing, that with the Lord, a day is as 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is one day. God is not slow. He's, he's not delaying needlessly. But he's giving every person an opportunity for repentance.